With a master's and food business degree from the prestigious Culinary Institute of America, Jason Wallace, a former executive chef restaurateur, is an innovative restaurant operations scientist. Wallace's client list reflects all genres of food service, including startups, quick service, full and limited service restaurants. Wallace's educational seminars for leadership development have been attended by prominent restaurant companies. As a food service educator, Wallace has served as a professor and guest lecturer at the New York Restaurant School, the Art Institute, Hudson and Westchester County Colleges. Wallace has been an active member of the New York State Restaurant Association, which was established in 1935, holding various leadership positions, including treasurer, vice chairman of the board of directors, and in 2010, Wallace became the first African-American chairman of the board for the New York State Restaurant Association. Mmm. Mmm. Man, y'all hear all that? Did y'all hear all of that? Man, that guy sounds like he's pretty thorough, man. Oh, man, oh, man. Hey, 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 thank you for coming to another episode Behind the Numbers with the Restaurant Scientist. My name is Jason Wallace, and I am the Restaurant Scientist, and I am the guy that they said all those wonderful things about. And that bio drop, very, very, very long career that I've had in this restaurant and food service industry. And it's not over yet because we still have God's work to do. Uh, this show always leans towards the ability to inspire and educate. Uh, we take an in-depth look at entrepreneurship, particularly in the food service and restaurant space. And we look at the challenges associated with um, all of the, the barriers of entry, as well as the ongoing challenges that we face. And today's guest um, comes from the world of entre entrepreneurship, but from the ice cream world. If you don't know, I one of my pet peeves, love, loves, passions, is ice cream. And I'm talking about ice cream, but like 14, 16% butter fat. Don't give me no low fat, low sodium, nothing. Give me all of the fat that's required. And I'm glad to have on today's show, Petrushka, Basin, Larson, owner of Sugar Hill Creamery in the wonderful village of Harlem, New York. Yes. True stuff. Wait, welcome, 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 welcome. Thank you, Jason. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Yes, thank you for coming on the show. So, what we want to do is today's topic for those that are following, um, we're going to talk about proof of concept and then expansion because certain brands, certain categories within the food service industry lend themselves to, okay, how do we now build multiple units? And even though your, your goal may not be to build multiple units where either you're in one of three positions, either you're going to do multiple units and you're going to be owner operator of all of those units, or you're going to do licensing deals where you'll be able to license your likeness and trademark items um, to others to pay you a fee, right? Which is another revenue stream business model. And then ultimately the third option is to franchise. So depending on an investor's strategy, right, which you know, again, behind the figures with the restaurant scientists, I'm all about how do we build wealth? Like, this is not a hobby for me. This should not be a hobby for those of you that are in the industry, um, for those that are looking to get to the next level within their careers. Maybe you're working at a food service establishment right now, and then ultimately you want to own your own food service brand. Um, the restaurant scientist is about building wealth. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. So when it comes to Harlem uh, Sugar Hill Creamery, you know, we're talking about smaller footprints. We're talking about a QSR, quick service kind of model. And then now we, we actually have the creator of it to kind of walk us through how she built her brand, uh, what's in her current portfolio, and then talk about some of the trials and tribulations associated with that. And then ultimately... The last thing I'm going to say, I always talk about it. What's the exit strategy? At what point do we get to a point where we've signed a five or 10 year lease or we've built one to 10 or more units? And then now ultimately, some we do we want to sell them all is the goal to position them so that we leave them to our our kids uh, or do we position it to sell or to continue to grow? So as we talk about those various options, 
franchising, licensing, or owner operators, uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna give you some inspiration and some insight on how to make those decisions and ultimately get to that exit strategy. Petruska, talk yes. to me. The yes. floor is yours. Okay. Um, so let's start. Let's start with the with the first one. Tell us okay. how you built your brand yeah. and what's currently in your portfolio. Okay, so we Sugar Hill Creamery opened its doors on uh, July 29th of 2017. The idea for the business was conceived on Memorial Day or Memorial Day weekend of 2016 in Washington, D.C. Um, my husband's background is in hospitality and my background is in museums and curating shows and doing museum education and working in community-based settings with like through art and with artists. Um, so to say that this is new to me. Oh, well, I'm, I've been <laughs> seven years in the industry, but this is not how I was trained. This is not what I went to school for. Um, but he was a GM of Telepan, uh, which was, I think, the only Michelin star restaurant on the Upper West Side at the time. And Bill decided to close his, his doors. And he had been open for a while, you know, well-established business, well-loved business. And um, that, you know, was a little bit of a curveball. Um, yeah. And I, I think a lot of entrepreneurs end up uh, being entrepreneurs because of curveball, uh, because of life circumstances, but maybe it's also in their blood. And for me, it was actually always in my blood. I just never really had an invitation to like lean into it. So um, the planets aligned. He was, he with everybody in his restaurant, they were all out of a job. Um, we had had our second child at that time. We were in DC for more Memorial Day weekend. We had lunch at Union Market. And then there was like a little pop-up ice cream shop in the market. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, let's get ice cream. I fell in love with uh, small batch ice cream uh, when I was in grad school in San Francisco. And so, you know, I was like always looking for the next best scoop. Um, so I was like, right. let's yeah. try his place. And it was like a Philadelphia based business that's no longer in business anymore, actually. And then when we were walking to the car with our cones in hand, I was like, we should open an ice cream shop in Harlem. <laughs> because yeah, and all great ideas come to life. Okay. Um, in those yep. moments. So we, you know, we both lived in Harlem for 20 years, 25, no, 20, 21 years. Um, yep. And at that time, it was not that, you know, maybe, what, 13 years. Um, and he said, when we first started dating, like, I want to open my own restaurant. And I was like, okay, but like, what's the concept? Because again, entrepreneurship, I think has always been in my blood since like third grade, mm -hmm. but being born to the parents that I was born to, who are both entrepreneurs in their own right, mm -hmm. they still were like, you need to go to school. Okay. So you don't go to school to be an entrepreneur, you know, like you go to school right. for other things. You, you know, entrepreneurship within your blood, you know how to read your numbers and yep. you are just naturally that. So all that to say, I was able to convince him after six months of convincing um, that we should do this. And uh, we found our first location, uh, which is on Lenox between 119th and 120th. It yep. very, like we lived several hundred yards from that door. Um, so it's yeah. a, it's a, it's a store in our neighborhood. Um, and we found it that fall of 2016 and then we broke ground shortly after, and then we were opened by July and literally the dust was settling literally because the contractor <laughs> right. was doing what a lot of contractors do. Um, and I was like, yeah. we just have to open, like we only have a month and a half left of summer and this is our first year and like, yeah. we need to get going. So. Yeah, yep. that's how we, nice. how we started. Yeah, I know this, I know your spot very well, Lennox. We needed an ice cream parlor in, in Harlem at, at the time, and mm -hmm. you filled the void, and your product was good. Thank uh, you. So, yeah, we thank you for coming up with the idea and, and, and bringing it to fruition. So mm -hmm. let's talk about finances, right? Mm -hmm. you, know, give, you know, the reality of, one, how do you find a lease, right? How do you find a location? How many square feet do you need? Is mm -hmm. it equipped? Is it a vanilla box? Do you have to put a hood in it? Do you need a hood? Um, talk to me about that process of one, how you found the location. What were some of the things that you learned about signing a commercial lease for a restaurant yeah. space and then the capital requirements? Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about that and then move yeah. into equipment, right? And all that design okay. and layout. Types so of the Go reason ahead. why... The reason why I proposed that we should open an ice cream shop is because we don't need a hood. Um, I was yep. like, we don't have the money, the capital or the contacts to open a full service restaurant. So we need something that does not require all of that. 
Um, and so our location, we were, we had a broker that we met, like she was a broker in the neighborhood and she was looking for storefronts for us. We were touring, um, the neighborhood and everything was just kind of out of price range for us from our back of envelope projections. Um, this was our first rodeo. My husband went to culinary school, but he never worked back of house. He's always worked front, like service in front of house and management. Right. So we were just like, we're just really diving in, you know, just right, right, <laughs> making a lot right. of risk here. Um, and from those back, they were pretty, I would say they were conservative projections, but I was just like, these square footage prices are not supporting what we believe we're going to do. The we revenue, yeah. got very lucky in that um, we walked, we were walking up Lenox and the storefront where we ended up getting our lease was a nail salon. And then I knew, I knew, and it's a funny story, it's Anthony's sister-in-law. I think I told you this when we met in Chicago. But Anthony's sister-in-law was the proprietor of this salon. I was a mm -hmm. client there. And I knew, because I know my neighborhood, and so does my husband, like, I was like, the gate is usually up at this time. That's weird. Um, and so then we asked the broker, we were like, can you look to see if this storefront is available? It's on the market. And she called around and she was like, it actually hasn't listed yet, but if you can get all of your application materials in by Friday, it could probably be yours. So um, it became ours. But now I mentioned it was a nail salon. It was not a, it was not a establishment, right? So there's a lot of capital expense that goes into turning something that was not made for food into something that is for food. It was not a white box. There were foot basins and a waxing right. room. Not, <laughs> but, not a place where, you know, yeah, we can yeah, make yeah, ice cream. Wanna... So it took us a little while and it took us about, it was like $200,000 to, um, to get that space to where it needed to be. And that was the, that has, that was the majority of our, the equipment. We had a small batch freezer it was Emery Thompson. Um, Emery Thompson, yeah. American and, made yeah. Emery Thompson. Amer Shout yeah. out American made so, products. <laughs> yes. And you know, it, it, it wasn't a big machine. We were making everything there. Um, in that door when it, we closed, you know, we, we were open in the afternoon to the late evening, we reset and then ice cream was being made from like midnight to 6 a.m. And then yep. the person that was working that shift, sometimes it was my husband, somebody, sometimes it was, you know, another person on our Facebook team and then yep. they would go home and then I would open the store a couple hours later to do some program. You know, we have a new moms group. We do a lot of community-based programming and then we would open the store again. So, um, Nice. So the, the fun facts, though, I will say for anybody who's based in New York listening, um, the building that that store is located is owned by the New York City Housing Authority. And that means that square footage price is below market rate, which is why I was like, oh, I feel comfortable with this because this is not the rent that I'm seeing everywhere else. And yeah. so that's, they have a yeah. whole website where they list their properties. So for anybody listening who's looking to open a brick and mortar, go check it out. Nice, nice. Because you have... At the time, Boulevard Bistro was across the street from you, and uh, was, we had uh, yeah, Satipani I mean, was down the street. We shared so, a block with Satipani, who was, yep. you know, a pioneer in uh, in the restaurant space in, in Harlem. I mean, on Lennox for sure. You know, they've been there yeah. over 20 years. Um, Boulevard Bistro was, what, I think 121st, so yep. diagonal. Cafe Lattes across the street. Um, yep. Archer and Goat. Um, they opened like a year later, but we were in the same community board meeting trying to get our signage and frontage just approved and stuff. And yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah, that's that's very familiar. So quick story. When Satapani, you know, it was a it was a bakery pastry shop at first. But when um, when I say we because I was their consultant when they switched over to what it oh. is now. OK. And I remember calling Nino the day we were supposed to have a soft open, like the day we had some reporters coming, you know, media coming, uh, local clergy. And I walk, I get there, it's like seven in the morning, no construction's going on. I'm talking like nothing. We're gonna open at four o'clock the same afternoon. I called Nino on the phone, I was like, I don't know where your, where your contractor is, but you need to get them over here. We still had a, con it was still a construction site, like literally tables weren't, boxed. chairs were still in boxes, the tables were being delivered. Um, the bar wasn't done. I had guys in the, in the kitchen, the kitchen was done. So they're back there prepping, but the, the whole front, the whole, what you see now over there, it was a mess. And I just started, the guys show up. I start yelling, I'm like, get this shit. 
get this, get these ladders out of here, start cleaning up these walls. So we, we made it. Basically, long story short, by the time people walked in at 4, 430, we were passing hors d'oeuvres and serving cocktails and no one had a clue. So those yeah. are just some of the nightmare horror stories, but some of the things now we joke about it. Um, and now, you know, even the kids have taken over, uh, his daughter's taken over. She was a little, she was a little thing at the time. Uh, yeah. so I know the block. I love it. Um, I know your product. Let's talk a little bit about, um, what's currently in your portfolio, right? Like, is this your only location? I know no, the answer. So we have to, four right? locations. So let's talk and a little about bit about your, your, your entire group. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, Sugar Hill Hospitality, uh, operates four locations. Three of them are um, in Harlem. So that first location is in central Harlem on Lenox and 119th. Our second location that we opened on Halloween of 2020, folks. Okay. Someone <laughs> give me an award. Okay. At first, <laughs> oh, I'm alive. Um, that is on uh, Broadway between 149th and 150th. And then our third Harlem location um, is in East Harlem uh, on Lexington and 103. Then um, we opened in the timeout market. Uh, which is in Dumbo, um, not far from. Uh oh, right. Um, so we opened in the Time Out Market, which is not uh, not far from the Jane's Carousel. It's in Dumbo. Um, mm. we, that was actually our third location, but not our third store, right? So I mean, not our third Harlem store. So that East Harlem store we just opened last year. Um, so we're in those four locations. We're actually going to also be in Sidetown um, in the coming week. Uh, we'll be in residence there, uh, operating their ice cream truck. But Sidetown, which is located basically like in the East Village, um, it's open to anybody. So anybody can go to that ice cream truck, but it's within their sort of residential community. Uh, gotcha. I, yeah. How do you expand, right? We're talking about one, now that you have proof of concept, right? You had mm -hmm. one location, you felt comfortable enough that the numbers, right, the gross sales, and the mm -hmm. EBITDA, the earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization, was throwing off enough cash flow. Because again, mm -hmm. this is not right. This is not a hobby. So clearly, you would not be opening up more locations if you weren't making money. So right. kudos to you. Um, but so talk to me about once you feel comfortable, because we're all a little nervous at that first location, because you know sure. we still don't know if there's proof of con. Like, is there a demand? Is it a fad? Uh, or is it a trend? Right. Uh, you know, you get that initial bump sometimes when you open up because you're the new kid on the block and people want to try you. But then right. once they try you, you know, after about a year or so, you kind of hit that that plateau and you right. want to see if you have sustainability to either, you know, make that that hockey puck. Right. And we call it a hockey puck in terms of you want that. Uh, I mean, a hockey stick. You want those sales to go up and then you want to jump to the next right. level. Right. Um, so talk to me about what. What did the numbers tell you uh, that gave you the confidence that, one, we, now we know we have proof of concept, two, now we have policies and procedures and systems in place that mm -hmm. now we could duplicate it? Because many people can only run one location right. because they don't have the ability to duplicate what they've done. In most cases, it's because they don't know what they're doing right or wrong. So there's no way to actually put a GPS roadmap to together to say, okay, now we can do this again. Talk to me right. how you were able to accomplish that. Okay, so our second store was, it, it became a second store because we just were maxed out on our capacity to produce the ice cream that we needed to produce. We also have a catering program. So that's basically what I call my like, well now my sixth store, you know, like my sixth, you know, it's floating. It's anywhere you wanna be. Um, and keeping up with the, <laughs> Um, keeping up with production for those orders with our existing store was very hard and storage was also an issue. We didn't have a lot of place to store anything. So we we're like, we need a second store. Now, some people were like, why get a second store? Why don't you just get like a, be in a commissary kitchen and just do that? Well, one, you can't just, ice cream operation can't just pop into any commissary kitchen. There are different regulations for dairy. Um, and two... In, like incurring another rent, basically to, to use that space without additional revenue necessarily promised to me, made both of us nervous. So Absolutely. 
We were like, you heard okay. what she said? Uh, drop, that was a bomb drop right there. Additional expense, i.e. rent, without another revenue stream. Yeah. That's guaranteed. That was guaranteed. the knowledge she just dropped. Thank you for dropping that knowledge. Go ahead. So, <laughs> so we were like, okay, the production space has to also have a store, right? It just has to. We're going to be there, so it's going to be fine. But, like, and, right. and, we, and we looked around. We looked in the Bronx. We looked... Um, Upper Manhattan, and this place that and we ended up finding was the one on Broadway between 149th and 150th. Similar to the first location, it too was not a food establishment. So the majority of the expense there was gut renovating it and making it what it is now. It was the barber shop that had not been functional, I think, for a very long time. So, and now we were doing that at the beginning of COVID. Mm -hmm. I'm still here to tell about it. So that's why I feel like I can do anything. Um, I'm capable of all things that I survived. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, that's basically how the second store came to be. Because people were like, what? You guys are opening a second store? Like, it, it didn't come from a, now we need to make more money. It really was a, we're not going to be able to operate and continue to grow and make more money. We don't have the second store. And this is the way that we have to do it. Because it, we don't have a guaranteed, like, contract that we know is going to support the rent for that commissary space. Now, the third location, that came because of our brand. That came because we were, we had established ourselves as a small batch ice cream operator, and I'm not going to get into the difference between small batch and continuous freezing ice cream. Anyway, in New York, <laughs> but, and, and, and we had an established brand, uh, which we can talk about later, um, that I believe is what invited us into the timeout market. They had an ice cream concessioner that decided not to, um, decided not to continue business when COVID hit. And so by 2021, uh, they had an opening slot and they just reached out to us. It was timeout, you know, timeout market is run. It's the same company or thing, you know, folk behind timeout magazine. And so they are a media entity, right? So they, they'd mm -hmm. covered us before listed our ice cream, listed our birthday party packages and all these things. And so they reached out and they said, would you all be interested? Now at that time we were just coming out of opening the second store. So we were very tired and crispy on the edges. And we're like, I don't think we need to do that. But instead of saying no, we decided to go for an interview. Uh, I mean, not an interview, a walkthrough rather, uh, which is kind of an interview of, for both parties. And we were like, oh, the hard part of our business to date has actually been these gut renovations of stores that were not food establishments. We're already mm -hmm. making the ice cream. So in this case, we're just kind of plugging and playing. Like we're already making the ice cream. We already have great teams. So we're just going to bring the team and the ice cream. And so that's how the third store looked open. Now the fourth store in East Harlem that's been our easiest opening because it was already a food establishment. That was the lesson. We were like, gotcha. no more storefront. No, no, yeah, no, yeah, no more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No Second more. generation restaurants. Yep. We, that's what we need. Okay. And so, I mean, surprisingly, it's actually the highest rent that we pay. Um, and and uh, and to be frank, because I, I imagine this is the podcast where everybody wants to know the truth, right? That's <laughs> That's our lowest performing store. Now, yeah. we thought, we were like, well, we're established. Maybe it around. Maybe it was a little bit of bravado there. Like, we're going to open and everything's going to come, you know? And it's like, we <laughs> open and people can't, you know, for the first couple months. But then who we'll fancy the sales, Peter? Now, we did comps from last year this, or April uh, this year versus last year. And transactions are up and sales are up. So that's great. But it's just to say that there's still a lot of work to do there, right? For people to, <laughs> to know the brand and to want to come and make that their ice cream or dessert option of choice. And also East gotcha. Harlem is just a different vibe than other parts of Harlem. So yeah, it is, it is, it is. It is. Talk to me about the seasonality of sales. Like you would think is, does, is, yeah. is it true that in the winter time sales do fall off? I mean, I eat ice cream all year round, yes. but that doesn't Everybody mean that, the rest that. Everybody's like, well, that doesn't make sense. I eat ice cream year round. I'm like, but you're eating pints from your freezer that you got yeah. from the grocery store, okay? That either right. you ordered it in your delivery, grocery delivery, or you picked it up when you were in the aisle. You weren't thinking, let me go to my local ice cream operator and go pick up their pints that cost way more than the grocery store's pints, right? Because our pints yeah. cost way more than the grocery store. Um, yeah. And the price is different and, you know, whatever. But that said, uh, ice cream is absolutely, in a four-season climate, it is absolutely a seasonal business. So anybody listening that wants to open an ice cream shop, people come into my DMs all the time. Like, I want to open an ice cream shop. I want to make my own ice cream. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> but right, as I think right. I shared with you, it was like, there are 
so it, there's no easier way to spread joy than selling ice cream, but there are so many easier ways to make money, especially right. if you are making the ice cream. It's just a lot, you know, but yep. we love it. So that's why you need to love what you do. But that said, right. um, yeah. our season begin in like, it starts to uptick March. So we're kind of kind of creeping up on the roller coaster ride, right? And then we're at that first, di- like that first hill of the ho- roller coaster, um, May, June. And okay. then we're going down from July, <laughs> we're going down, you know? And so because July, I mean, because of where we are, right? We're in a neighborhood. We're not in Times Square. We're not in a like, oh. like central New York tourist destination location where you have a ton of foot traffic. So we see the seasonality in like, even in the, what you, people might think as the ice cream season, because people leave their yeah, 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 schedules yeah. change in the summer. Right. And yeah, so the kids July, are out of school, yeah. they're out of school, but they're doing other things. They're, you know, they're yep, whatever yep. they're doing, they're traveling with their family. So they're, you know, sales are, we're making the most of our money from, uh, I would say mid to end of March to August. Right. But July and August are lower than May and June. Mm. So you must be a genius with cash flow handling. Well, you have, I mean, you kind of have to be good. You know, let me, let me, let me set, let me set this up for my listeners. So cash flow is really our ability in the restaurant game. I can I guess it's the same in other industries, but for us is what's that cash flow you have that you could run 60 to 90 days. Right. So if your rent is five grand and your labor is five grand a week, right. You could, you can, I could come in as a restaurant, you know, consultant and say, okay, based upon what you have in your checking account, in your operating account, not your payroll or, you know, any other tax accounts, you have a 90 day run period before you literally run out of cash, cash flow, cash flows, three ways, investing opportunities, financing opportunities, and, 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 and the ability to understand how those two work, investing opportunities and financing, right? So money only flows two ways in or out. So if I'm investing, I'm investing outside of myself, or even if I'm investing in my own business, if she's buying a new machine or buying new machines or opening up new locations, she's taking the cash inflows from revenues and putting them into outflows into investment, right? So now the ability to understand what that looks like in those negative months, right? When you have negative sales, right? Negative revenue, but you have greater expenses, that means that on those months when you do have greater sales, your your revenues, your cash flow is positive. You need to have that money. So you have to be like, I want to, you know, applaud you because your ability to manage that and then also pull out the capital that's required to then reinvest in your brand is very impressive. Doesn't it sound exhausting? Because it is. Man. Anyway, let me post it. Let me just also that um, I would not be telling the full story if I didn't also say that, like, we absolutely use, like, well, we were moving it over to a line of credit. But, like, during those winter months, we use our credit card to flow some of the the non-fixed expenses. You get them credit card points, you know, and then you pay it off when when it's, you know. So that needs to be said because er not every entrepreneur depends on what your model is, but for food businesses yeah. where the margins are very slim, it's like you you just need to use what's available to you at the cheapest rate possible. So if you yep. line of credit is definitely the way to do it. Um, yep. And then pay it off, you know? Absolutely. Anyway. So when the other third part was the operating act investment activity. So I said op- uh, financing. So then at that point, the operating activities, money only flowing two ways in and out is very important. Let me ask you this, now that I think about it, now that you brought it up, what about staffing? Like, do you keep, like when no, is it hard to keep staff all all year round, or do you hire them seasonally? Like, what does that look like? What's your infrastructure look like at the corporate level, as so, well as the unit level? Yeah, so the majority of our staff are um, with uh, like the front of house team. We have yeah. the largest the team is is now. It's like basically college gets out. We we Got don't. You. If you are in college and listening to this, please don't email me. Oh. <laughs> it's usually people that have been working with us from like high school, they go to college and then we're like, yes, you can come back. Um, but, but that said, you know, people are home for, for, from college and we have more business. We have more catering. We, you know, it's busier at the stores. Um, and then we start paring down um, once school starts again. So mm. all cool. Um, and this is the thing. 
we don't have like a, a beginning and end because we're opened 362 days of the year. We don't really have like a, oh, season's ending, right? It's like, for us, right. it's like, okay, sales are going down. That's how, you know, that's how we think about it. Right. <laughs> um, um, but naturally, people are going back to school. So there's a kind of an, an organic opting out that happens. Yep. Um, yep. And then there are people that are um, not in school, either because of their age, you know, or they live in the neighborhood, they can still work and, and go to school and then they stay with us. It's not, there's not really a hard and fast, like, okay, your last day is always going to be August 31st. And that's, you know, when we don't, we don't do that. Um, it right. just kind of worked out the way that it hit. I will say though, uh, in 2021, we were like, we want to keep everybody whole, everybody, anybody still gets a job. We are going to overstock. <laughs> our cap would like never do that again because um, yeah, you yeah, don't yeah. have the business to support that kind of um, that. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, and, and as you said earlier, um, the one thing I want to point out, being the ice cream connoisseur of myself, myself, um, the quality of your product is impressive. So I want to thank you for that. Um, I, which is going to segue me over into research and development. Like, mm -hmm. you know, cause we, we're talking a little bit about human capital, right? Human capital is the most important thing that's in our, in our, in our businesses, but not reflected on our balance sheet. So for those of you that own restaurants out there, you know, if you don't have humans to do the job, um, and you don't invest in that, it's going to be hard for you to build your brand. And then the next thing is if you truly want to build wealth in the restaurant industry, don't chase the money, create new jobs, right? When you're creating additional jobs, the money's automatically coming, right? The revenue is coming because now you have another location and you have more revenue coming in. And then that's how you get a bigger piece. So you go from having, I don't know, say average unit stores, a half a million dollars, right? So if you got four stores, you got a total business of $2 million business, right? But if you start with one store at a half a million, Right now, the goal is to create you got 20 jobs there, combination of part and full time. And now I create another. I make that and create that cash flow, take the cash flow, invest it into the second one. Mm -hmm. Now, my brand, right, this hospitality group I have is now a million dollar business because now we got two half million dollar businesses. Right. So right. the ability to understand that uh, for the listeners out there is, is critical. Human capital is very, very important. Uh, but when now it comes to your product, your brand. She touched on it a little bit. I think she didn't want to throw shade on, you know, continuous versus small batch. So, you know, we're not we're not going to we're not going to poke or throw any daggers at the larger companies out there that you're buying. But it's just it's it's exactly that. When you are a small batch operator, you're making basically six gallons at a time. Right. So depending on your formulas and your cream and 10 percent, 8 percent. 12%, 14%, 16% butterfat, whatever it is you have, that's where the quality comes in. And um, when you go, it, you'll, you'll, you'll taste that quality, which is why, you know, you, you, you should be willing to pay a little more because the quality is there. So talk to me about how you do research and development, coming up with flavors and yeah. figuring out which flavors are not doing so well. Uh, and, you know, what, who, who's the scientist behind that? So, okay, I'm going to tell you a very funny story that we'll talk to the cash flow part that, you know, that you just touched on. When we yeah. started this, I remember I told you, my husband has always worked front of house. He's not, and he's gone to culinary school. So I was like, you need to go to culinary school if you want to open a restaurant. You need to understand how this sausage is packed, you know, just at the very yeah. least. <laughs> um, and, but he never worked on the line and he's never worked under a chef in that capacity. So when we embarked on this, we really embarked on this as food entrepreneurs and not as like chef creative people that had like loved ice cream for so long and wanted to share it with their, you know, neighbors. Okay. Right. We brought on a pastry consultant that um, was a pastry chef at a restaurant where he used to work. And um, we worked with him and we also consulted with some of his other pastry friends on some of the flavors at when we first opened. And then remember, I told you we opened on July 29th of 2017. And I also just told you that sales start to go down in July, in July and August, okay? So yeah. <laughs> we were in our first year and we've had that one and a half a month of, of summer and then we were going into our lowest cash flow time. And mm. we started off with like initially because I was working outside of our business for the first six months, but then I joined six months after. 
Um, and I, I quit my job and I joined um, full time. But we had my husband had a salary that our business could not support. And then mm -hmm. we also had our pastry consultant who was expecting to be paid every week. Uh, as we were in Q1 of 2018, well, if, if, if you all looked at the numbers, you were like, uh, this is not going to work for too long. <laughs> so we had to make those changes. Now, I asked, I was like, Nick, Nick is my husband. I was like, how many of the flavors that you have made? Because he obviously was learning how to make ice cream in the process of all of it, um, are performing well. And we regard performance just based on like, how very like qualitatively what goes the fastest i just put that bucket mm -hmm. in if it been mm -hmm. in my shit for three days or is yeah. it <laughs> dead, it does, right? right and so, like, how many of the flavors that you created are going are performing well right and he was like well and he started listing the flavors and i said how many of the flavors that our consultant who we love we were on his disney plus account and just a year ago just until a year ago uh, but how many of these flavors um, are performing at the same rate, right? And based on just that, again, back of envelope assessment and audit, it was like, well, wait, the guy that doesn't really see himself as the pastry chef here is actually making flavors that are performing better. And we don't have the cash flow to support both people. And so, unfortunately, we're going to have to have that hard conversation with the consultant who was generous enough to still give us his Disney Plus account. Um, for many years <laughs> after, um, but we're just gonna, we can't support this anymore. We cannot, I don't know if you can hear all these sirens. I'm sorry, New York. Um, anyway, but that said, we couldn't support, we could not support his salary and our salary. So I was like, well, we still have the function here because the person that's making the higher performing flavors is here. So yep. now that person has to lean into what it means to be the flavor scientist behind all of the things. Yeah. And in that process, his mother is even like, I mean, I had no idea he had this in him. I was like, well, you're welcome. It's the best decision he ever made, Mary. <laughs> like, what? Then, I mean, he's like blossomed as this like amazing flavor master, you know, and he has a yeah. formula for how he creates the flavors that I, I can't share the formula. Um, yeah, no, no, uh, absolutely but, uh, wouldn't want that. Uh, but I yeah. know there had to be someone behind it because that's, that's what, like you said, you don't want ice cream sitting in a case. Real no. simple. Oh. No, really I mean, so. you're not, the people don't like it. So what, like, carry, what, are you, what are you carrying? 12 to 16 flavors? How many carry, flavors? We carry 12 flavors just because 12? like, you know, New York real estate is what it is. We can't. Yeah, and yeah, the yeah, other yeah. thing okay. about our business is that you will notice when you come into the Lennox store, the majority of the space is dedicated to the customer experience. It's dedicated to them being able to sit and, and enjoy a conversation over a scoop. And an ice cream operation actually doesn't need that in order to sell ice cream. Everybody likes ice cream. You understand it. It doesn't take a lot of thought. It's a no-brainer, impulsive decision. You only really need a walk-up window, right? But yeah, because yeah. this didn't exist in our community, I was like, you can only go to Baskin and Robbins and go sit on a metal chair in the window. Nobody's doing that. It's not a vibe, you know, like yeah. we need a vibe for us. Like we need a place where you can go and have a date or have a conversation with a child, whatever, see a friend. And so a lot yeah. of our space is dedicated to that, which maybe is not the smartest business decision in the short term, but I do believe long term, it has built our brand as a, as a very people centric neighborhood inspired business that is also chef driven. Yeah. Now, Sylvia's is my client for a long time. And sometimes like on Sundays, the crowd, I mean, uh, someday, any day, it could be any day of the week. I literally would come to your shop to hide, like just go down there. Give me some ice cream. I just sit down there like that was my little lunch break or whatever and hide for it. Then I walk right back up Lennox and get right back in the fire. That's, uh, well, I love that. Yeah. So really love that. that's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, you, you, no yeah, it, it, it came. It comes through. It definitely comes through. And it is a vibe. And I'm glad you created that little space because, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes I just pull over in my car just to sit there. You know what I mean? Because we we're running and running and running. So when you come across a nice comfortable space like that uh is 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 very enjoyable so thank you for that thank you we're talking to petrushka basin larson owner of sugar hill Creamery in, in harlem new york um so we got about five minutes left yep we talked about the past we talked about the present what's in the future like what's the goal for q4 yeah. 24 q1 2 3 4 25 yeah so um 24 is just continuing to do what we're doing. I mean, we're going to open this fifth, like, 
not a store. It's an ice cream truck, but it is another place for commerce. Um, we're going to do that in the next couple of weeks. And so we'll close out the year um, hitting up like catering. We introduced like a winter package uh, earlier this year, end of last year. So we're going to kind of really lean into that. Um, and then in 2025, I mean, we really want to open a store downtown because what we built this business for our neighborhood and we feel like we've delivered on that and we are able to consistently deliver on that every day. So in a way, like we've accomplished that goal, but we realize that there is limitation to brand visibility for us because everybody's not going to travel to Harlem. Like if you live in Brooklyn, you're like, ah, oh, Harlem, maybe one day, right. you know, uh, <laughs> um, and time market does offer that um, sort of opportunity for people to enjoy our ice cream without coming all the way up to Harlem, but it's still within a market and it's not it's not exactly you know you have to want to be there even though there's so many delicious options when you go so i highly recommend anybody to go um there's something there for everybody but we're like what does it mean to be um in a different neighborhood that has higher yeah. book traffic um but at a place where the barrier to entry is lower like everybody is always you know in the village or you know um i don't think it'll be like a 34th street location or anything like that but Somewhere where there's a lot of traffic, right? That's gotcha. kind of where we're setting our sights. And then we're working on some like airport thing too. Um, gotcha. So, yeah. Gotcha. So I let me, let me, let me ask you this. As a CEO, COO, um, are you looking for investors? Like is the route to continuously grow company owned stores, licensing or so potentially franchising? I'm definitely not franchising and people ask okay. me all the time, not doing that. Um, okay. We have staff. I don't need owners to manage to. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it. but licensing is definitely of interest to us. Um, we are, we're not interested in opening quickly, but we are definitely interested in opening additional stores. We have um, one investor that came to us a year, two years ago. Excuse me. And the money that they gave us is on um, a safe. So I don't know mm -hmm. if you want to explain what that is, but mm -hmm. um, it's not. It's basically like if I decide not to do a raise, I don't really have to give that money back, right? Gotcha. Um, and it was the money that was given because they learned about us. I was on a panel in a closed room that they organized, wanting to hear other entrepreneurs talking about their businesses that they built. They had the ice cream. They love the ice cream. It's like one of the most I would say one of the most successful food entrepreneurs of our time that made that investment. Um, I also made sure that that investment was small enough that I could pay back if I needed to. Because right. I was like, I, I don't know if I want to do this. This has been a bootstrapped operation. We, we yeah. have some of our own capital, but a lot of it has been bank capital at, you know, a decent rate. And, um, it's cheap, and yeah. so, the cost of capital is cheaper if you're in debt versus equity. Right. So, you know, that said, though, I am, I think now seven years in, I, I can appreciate how, what kind of investors I need to take on. The answer to the short answer to your question is, yes, I'm open to that conversation now. And I was not open to it five years ago or four years ago or seven years ago yeah. because in so much we didn't know. And I was like, I'm not trying to hand over this new lifestyle that I've created for myself to somebody else that I don't know, you know, and now Absolutely. I understand what an investor relationship should be. So I have more, um, experience looking for the kind of investor that makes sense for our business if we decide yeah. to go in that, route, in that way yeah no not all not all money's good money i tell people that all of the time what's the cost of that capital and if you are going to invest you know i need silent investors like shut up shut right the fuck up. right <laughs> like that's silent like, right don't do that don't tell me what type of plates to buy forks silverware machine Nah, that's unless that's I not ask you, <laughs> right, right, right. So, but like, yeah. I don't. Yeah, anybody should want investors that really they believe in the founder. Absolutely. They believe, and 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 if they in that relationship are like, you know what, it's possibly you've outgrown your need to be the CEO, and you might need to yep. bring on a CEO. Then yep. that'll be cool. But it really should not be a top down. I'm telling you how to do this. I don't need another boss. I I mean. My customers are my bosses. My employees are my bosses, right? Like, that's that. Yeah. I don't need, yeah. you know, you're investing in what it is that we built and you're really only looking to add to it in a productive way that can, again, generate more revenue and allow us to 
hold on more to that mark that profit margin. That's absolutely that's it, you know. Nice, 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 nice. Well, let's give yeah, Petrushka a round of applause for taking the time and sharing her knowledge and experience um, with us. We have one minute left. Okay. How do people get in touch with you? Like, do your plug. Um, visit us on um, Instagram and TikTok. We are Sugar Hill Ice Cream. Um, you can, if you're listening to this and you're not ever coming to Harlem because you're in the city and not coming, or you're not in the city, you can always have our ice cream shipped to you on Gold Belly. Uh, we ship cakes and pints. Um, and then visit us at one of our stores. If you're in Harlem, we're in East, West, and, and Central Harlem. So just Google Sugar Hill Ice Cream or Sugar Hill Creamery and we'll come up. Um, or come visit us in the Time Out Market. And if you are in a business, I mean, sorry, in a, if you're working, you know, for someone else and you're like, I want to start a business, but I, I'm not there yet. But also we need some ice cream for this event. You can also, <laughs> our Damon Foreman will come bring ice cream to your, <laughs> your business. Be your dad. Nice, um, <laughs> nice, um, nice. You Patricia. Doing? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And, you know, the other thing is, is, you know, if you know of good locations where there's a void for, um, you know, Sugar Hill Creamy to come and put an ice cream, put that on her radar as well. Yes. Uh, and you can know. always reach out to me to get to her as well if you if you need to. Um, and hopefully we'll be doing some business together soon if you ever need a restaurant scientist on your team. Yes. Uh, either temporary or long term. But I would definitely have a passion for ice cream as well. So. Awesome. Thank you so yep, much. Yep, it's yep, such yep, a yep, pleasure yep. and an honor. Thank you. Okay, so that wraps up another episode. Mm, behind the figures with the restaurant scientists. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Cornerstone Business Labs, Cornerstone Production, and Cornerstone Media. Because if they wouldn't pay the bill, I wouldn't be here. The lights would be dark. Uh, so until we meet again, I want to thank everyone. Power to the people.